Welcome to E Padasala PG program for computer science students. Today we will be talking about scheduling policies with respect to RTOS. So, in this uh, lecture we will be discussing about the scheduling. First we will be discussing about the scheduling, then we will be discussing about the scheduling policies and some of the simple scheduling methods will be discussed and we will be discussing about the context switching and preemption in scheduling. First before getting into the scheduling, first we need to know that why we are going for scheduling. The first thing is when you are running a multi programming with respect to a particular application, then we wanted to utilize the CPU maximum. So, because of that the uh, I mean uh, system is uh, uh, doing the proper scheduling. So, the several process are kept in the memory at one time and every time a running process has to wait the another process can take over the use of the CPU. So, to make the CPU is utilized maximum people are going ahead with uh, best scheduling concepts. So, the scheduling of the CPU is fundamental to the operating system work. Operating system design concentrates uh, mostly on the scheduling of the CPU. So, the process execution consists of a cycle of the CPU time burst as well as IO time burst. So, the processes alternate between the CPU time burst and the IO time burst. So, eventually the final CPU burst ends with the system request to terminate the execution. When you are looking at the scheduler, it, it selects the process from the memory which are ready to be executed and it allocates the CPU to any I mean it, it allocates any one of them to CPU for process. So, when the CPU is scheduling, it is affected by the following set of circumstances. One is a process switches from running state to waiting state or a process switches from running state to ready state or a process switches from waiting state to ready state, a process switches from running to terminated state. So, when you are looking at all these four scenarios we will be uh, having this first uh, one that means running state to waiting state as well as running state to terminated state which occurred at non preemptive kind of scheduling. That means, preemption is not taking place with which these kind of setups. When you are looking at a uh, process which is I mean the CPU uh, uh, makes the running state I mean the scheduler makes running uh, the task of running state to ready state as well as waiting state to ready state this will be occurring only with preemptive preemptive kind of scheduler. So, when you are looking at the CPU the OS schedules the tasks. So, and the task is existing in the different states which are all waiting state, ready state or executing state. So, other than that or it may be terminated state, blocked state. So, all these things are also available, but the waiting state, ready state and execution state of the task are very very important states. So, here you just see that this pictorial representation tells you about clearly tells you about how the uh, scheduling is done by I mean scheduling is done by the OS with multiple tasks. So, if there is a new task is coming and it has been admitted and it, it, it when, when it is ready that means, it is ready it is ready with all its inputs and uh, process to be if the CPU is uh, allotted then it will be in a running condition. That means, the OS allots this particular schedules this particular task then it is in a running state. If suddenly there is an interrupt comes then this process is going towards a waiting state. So, sometimes due to interrupt or sometimes it is due to some I O request may be it is waiting for some inputs. So, that during the running it does not get that particular input. So, because of that it has been put under a waiting state or some event has to be 
happen I mean particular task is waiting for some event has to be done or it has to be finished then also it cannot proceed until the event has to be occurred. So, by the time also the system makes that task is under waiting state. So, if that I O is available or if the event is completed then again it has been put under a ready state. So, once if the CPU is free this has been again scheduled and it is running. So, sometimes when, when, when it is completely finished then it will be uh, finished in a finished situation. Sometimes it may be terminated also there is an interrupt so it may be terminated also. So, based on the situation the RTOS decides whether it has to make the system is under weight or it has to be executed or it is it has to be terminated. So, all those things is uh, decided by the scheduler. Now, the scheduling policy is how the processes are selected for promotion from the ready state to the running state. So, the right scheduling policy is meet all time requirements, the proper utilization of the CPU and the scheduling policies can deliver higher CPU utilization. So, this is the major uh, target of any of your uh, OS that means, the higher CPU utilization should be done with any uh, any kind of policies it is adopted for scheduling with respect to OS. So, when you are looking at a simple scheduling, so first we have to see uh, how the sch uh, scheduling is done. So, we have taken a very simple scheduling algorithm which has been used by uh, the OSS time division multiple access that means, TDMA is one kind of uh, uh, scheduling. Here what they have done over here is if I have 3 process or 3 task then I will be dividing the entire time slots with the equal time division which is otherwise called a hyper period. So, when you are looking at the hyper period one particular period is there, there if 3 task is there then the hyper period is divided into equal time slots, each one slot is allotted for the one one task. So, now remember that if process 1 is occurring then it will be I will be looking at which is the task is ready. Now, the process this time slot is for process 1 then I will be looking at the P 1 has to be given the uh, CPU P, 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 P 1 will be uh, scheduled for uh, processing. So, it is running once its time is getting over that means, the hyper period is divided into equal time slots. So, the first period is over then whether the P 1 is required I mean uh, having uh, more things to be completed uh, to be complete, but still it has been made it into weight and P 2 is assigned for its time slot. Then it is when P 2 is getting executed it, it has been allowed to execute till to complete its period. Once its period is over still it has it, it was not complete P, uh, this scheduler what it does is it makes it has to be weight then it, it allots the next slot for the process 3. That means, with the fairness the all the time slots are allotted for the different process which are available with that particular system. So, now the process is always run in the same time slot. So, if P 1 is running in time slot 1 it this will be running in the time slot 1 of the next hyper period that means, periodically this occurs. So, P 1 if it occurs as a time slot 1 in hyper period 1 in hyper period 2 also in time slot 1 this will be happening. When you are looking at P 2 if it occurs in the time, time slot 2 then for the next hyper period also this will uh, uh, this will run in only time slot 2. So, that way the time slots uh, will be maintained the same way that means, the process always run in the same time slot. So, depending on the deadlines for some of the process some time slots with will be empty. That means, what they are trying to say over here is after this P 1 is completed at this particular time slot. Then, when you are looking at the next hyper period where P 1 is completed. So, the time slot allotted for P 1 will not be used by others. So, now when you are looking at the third hyper period the P 1 slot is empty idle and the P time 2 slot is available given for P 2 time 3 slot is given for P 3. So, for the next period there also the time slot 1 is not allotted it is uh, idle and P 2 P 3 takes its own respective 
time slots T2 and T3. So, when you are looking at this kind of allotment, we know that if the process ends earlier, then allotted slots for them is not uh, used properly and it is wasted. So, that, that uh, wastage is uh, making the scheduling of this particular policy, I mean the uh, time TDMA multiply T, TDMA kind of scheduling is not that much efficient when you are looking at the CPU utilization, CPU is wasted during the idle periods. So, people are thinking that this has to be avoided when you are looking at the different algorithm. So, the next is your round robin algorithm, where what they have done over here is the same thing what we have uh, used for your TDMA is used here also. That means, the hyper period is divided into equal time slots. If I have 3 process, so hyper period divided by 3 will be the 1 1 time slot. So, time slot 1, time slot 2 and time slot 3 is given, P 1 for time slot 1, P 2 for time slot 2 and P 3 for time slot 3. So, that way it has been allotted. So, now when I am thinking that P 1 has to do, P, P 2 has to do, P 2 3 has to do its work. So, when we found that P 1 is over at this particular time period, then in the round robin, when you are looking at P 1 is not uh, available for the process, then that particular time slot, the T 1 time slot will be occupied by P 2 and P 3 will uh, in turn occupies the time slot 2. That means, the CPU is not idle for the time slot of uh, T 1. So, it has been scheduled that way. So, because of that, uh, the CPU is not idle at the starting of the slots, but remember still I have a problem. If I have a hyper period of 3, P 2, P 3 is scheduled at the front slot, but the third slot time slot 3 is not used by anybody. So, when it goes for the next hyper period, by the time again P 2, P 3 is scheduled with T 1 and T 2, but still there the T 3 is wasted. So, though we have reduced uh, the wastage due to uh, equal scheduling with the TDMA, but here still the wastage is there. But people are not waiting for, I mean the, the task 1, task 2 and task 3 is not waiting uh, for the time, their time slots. They will be scheduled in the earlier time slots itself, so that it gets executed and it finished the works earlier. So, this is actually a second kind of uh, scheduling algorithm, but uh, remember these algorithms are having a equal time slots and it has been assigned to these process. That means, a fairness is maintained while allotting the time slots for all your uh, multiple tasks. So, this, this, these are all simple algorithms, but fairness is maintained that the scheduler has uh, done this uh, work with uh, very less complexities. So, when you are looking at the uh, uh, round robin method, we will be uh, knowing that some of the time slots are wasted. So, what people thought is, uh, if some of the things where I can, uh, some places where I can reschedule so that uh, the idle time can be minimized. So, that is one, one thing and another one is, if I am looking at, uh, if somebody who is given a top priority, can we schedule him before itself? If somebody is working and if I wanted to schedule him earlier itself, because he is of uh, instead of looking at the fairness, I am looking at the job's nature. If some of the job is required, uh, it has to be finished earlier, then can I give priority so that he will be scheduled earlier. So, all those things are uh, the problems which uh, we are keeping in, in our mind when you are looking at the embedded system scheduling, I mean uh, algorithms. If the algorithm is having that kind of support, then maybe that is suitable with respect to your embedded systems. So, people are going towards priority based scheduling algorithm with respect to embedded systems. So, anyway with the priority based as well as if I am looking at this normal embed, I mean uh, scheduling, when we are making it one process is occurring and we will be terminating it, we will be scheduling other one, we are terminating it, we are scheduling other one. So, if I am doing it, how I will be restoring P 1 again or P 2 again or P 3 again. So, what is the uh, process has happened uh, when you are making it this kind of schedulings in between. So, all those things we have to discuss. 
So, the first thing which we need to discuss about this particular concept is preemption. So, the, the thing is preemption here is and uh, the set of registers uh, I mean uh, when, when you want I, as I told you if sometimes some of the tasks should be given a top priority and it has to occur before whatever be the thing which is scheduled or sometimes the IO devices is requesting for uh, an uh, service that means the interrupt is called. So, if the interrupt is called he has to give in the topmost priority. So, for that particular reason we have to stop what will be the process which is going on over there and the interrupt service routine has to be run by the time. So, if that is the case how I will be handling all these things that means, uh, making a uh, particular task to be under uh, waiting state and some of the state which is ready has to be again launched for processing. So, that has been done with the help of context that means, the switching I mean uh, rather I can call it as using context switching uh, different uh, processes can be scheduled in a uh, different different manners. So, the data structure which holds the state of the process is known as process control block. So, the context switching is nothing but switching from one process register set to another is known as context switching and the set of registers which define a process are known as its context. So, now if I am storing this particular context in a particular uh, data structure which is otherwise which, which has been called it as process control block or task control block. So, this, this keeps all the informations about the current status of the process and current informations which are available in the different registers which will be uh, stored in this particular uh, control block. So, when you are looking at context switch when the CPU switches to another process the system must save the state of the old process and load the saved state for the new process. So, now when you are looking at uh, the uh, the scheduler when it when, when it is switching from one process to next process we know very well that the current process state has to be saved somewhere so that uh, the the, st the state of the old process is save, saved with context switch and we have to i mean context switching that means we'll be saving the state of the old process as well as we'll be loading the state of the new process so this particular process is otherwise called a context switch so the context of the process represented in the either pcb or with respect to uh, embedded system it can be called it as tcb also so the time it is uh, time it takes is dependent on the hardware support so uh, remember that we are storing something about the current process and we are loading some of the informations from the uh, memory to the new process. So, definitely we will be handling the memory by the time when you wanted to store something for, for the current process when we wanted to load something from the memory for the uh, next process. So, we will be accessing the memory. So, when you are accessing the memory definitely it takes some time. So, the time it takes is dependent on the hardware support that means the memory support. So, the context switch time is the overhead if it takes more time then I will say that uh, instead of running a particular uh, I mean instead of uh, shed scheduling the CPU for a particular task most of its time is taken through by the context switching itself. So, if it takes a very less time then uh, we can we can do the work with the useful time. So, this uh, shows the picture about the context switching where a process A is there and process B is there the process A is uh, happening at this particular time uh, the switch occurs. So, that I have to uh, move the uh, CPU to process B process B is over up to this. So, I have to start from this particular one. So, if this is a case the, the S 1 the switch from the user space to kernel space. So, what will be the thing which we will be uh, using it over there with the status of process A is stored with the context that means, it is stored in the kernel space. Now, what will be the process B's information which is available in the switch S2 is transferred to the kernel. So, that it, it the process B starts running. So, now this pictorial representation tells you about how the context switching takes place between the process. Now, a process P0 is there where it is executing. At, at this particular point it is getting a switch context switch that means, it time slot is over. So, now the system there is an interrupt or a system call. So, that 
this time it, it, it says that the, your time is over. So, now what it does is it saves all the contents status of that particular time uh, the system's time is stored with your PCB process control block of 0 task process 0. So, PCB 0 in this particular place all the information is stored. Now, I will be uh, I mean the scheduler will say that who will be the next process to be scheduled. So, now if I am if the system says that process B has to be scheduled then the uh, state of PCB 1 is reloaded back. So, what will be the PCB 1 which contains a status of the second process is reloaded back. So, once it is reloaded the system is CPU is allotted for process 1. So, now it, it is getting executed. So, its time is over. Then it will be uh, once the system says that the scheduler says that your time is over then what will be the status of this particular process 1 is saved in PCB 1. Now, maybe uh, uh, maybe P 1, P 2, P 3 so many processes are there they will be uh, given their own time slots Maybe at the end I am just uh, getting again the slot for P task 1, 0 then if I am getting a time slot for P 0 then what will be the content I have stored in PCB 0 which is available there in that particular state which is again reloaded and that CPU is scheduled given for processing the process 0. So, this is the way your context which uh, has been used uh, so that all the process are scheduled in a different different time slots. So, that everybody is utilizing the CPU properly and the CPU time is optimally utilized. So, the multitasking operating systems are based around a multitasking kernel which controls the time slicing mechanisms. So, a time slice is the time period each task has the execution before it is stopped and replaced during a context switching. So, this is periodically triggered by hardware interrupt from the system timer. So, each and every time slot as I told you with the TA, TDMA a time time, uh, time is uh, each time slot is set with your system timer each time one particular time slot is over this timer in turn generates a hardware interrupt which periodically triggering the different context switching. So, this interrupts may provide the system clock and several interrupts may be executed and counted uh, before a context switching is performed. So, when a context switch is performed the current task is interrupted. So, the processes registers are saved in a special table uh, and for that the particular task and the task is placed back onto the ready ready state list. So, when you are looking at this kind of context switching the system is the that particular task is ready only thing is we are scheduling CPU for a some other task. So, because of that after putting it uh, that particular task then we will be making it it is in a ready state list. So, it is and it is waiting for the another time slice. So, the special tables often called the task control blocks stores all the information about the system requires about that particular task. So, context switching when you are looking at uh, this this picture shows that the context switching uh, may be this is the task 1, task 2, task uh, sorry may be task A, B, C, D, E is there. Uh, this is the place where the context switching occurs and it, it uh, the system uh, hands uh, I mean uh, handing over the scheduler hands over the CPU for the task B. Once this time slot is over the CPU is given for task C the CPU is given for task D. So, that way it goes uh, in a maybe the next is again task A again B C D. So, that way it goes uh, remember that each and every task is given a equal schedule and each and every time and the when the time slot is over context switching occurs. So, that the status of this particular task is saved and the next uh, I mean the current status of the next task is reloaded and the processing is occurring. So, this is the way the scheduler takes care about processing of multitask with, with the uh, scheduler with so much of uh, helps from this particular context switching. So, now we just see that how uh, this has been stored that is also very very important. So, when you are looking at context switch when I am getting a context switch the processor registers what will be the content of the processor registers which will be stored in a task A table maybe this is uh, process A if, if it is a process A then it, it gets a uh, time slot over then what will be the registers the processor registers which will be transferred to in the system memory 
one particular area is allotted for task A table. This is otherwise called a PCB for task A. So, this the whole content is transferred over there. Now, once it is uh, completely transferred over there and we will be looking at next what is the next task. So, if I am thinking that task B is the next task, then I will be going to the system memory, I will be looking at what is the task B table contents. So, the whole thing is transferred to the system register, processor registers. After that, uh, the system is says that uh, uh, the whole, uh, whole content is placed, now it is ready for uh, I mean uh, process. So, the CPU now runs on the task B. So, this is the way the context switching is occurs with respect to memory as well as CPU, so that the contents of task A or task B is not distorted or disturbed and it is temporarily stored it in its own tables and it will be reloaded for the process uh, when it gets the time slot. So, when you are looking at uh, the context switching, the steps are save the context of the processor including the program counter and other registers, update the PCB of the running process with its new state and other associated informations. So, now move the process control block of the appropriate uh, PCB to appropriate queue ready and blocked. So, select the another process for execution. So, now update the PCB for the selected process, restore the CPU context from that of the selected process. So, these are the steps we have to follow when you are looking at your context switching, so that uh, or the scheduler does the job without having any uh, problem. So, when you are looking at the real time operating system, uh, there are two types of the basic, I mean two, there are two basic type of messages uh, the kernel will deal with while you are looking at your context switching. So, that is the flags that can control, but not carry any implicit informations, uh, it, it is often called it as events or semaphores. It's messages which can carry information and it can control the task also, which is otherwise called messages or events. So, these are the things which we need to know about the context switching with respect to multitasking in scheduling, uh, in, in, in schedulings. So, when you are looking at the context switching, uh, here we will be in a position to understand that the scheduler schedules P1, P2, P3, so many things, suddenly I am getting an interrupt that means an IO request, so that the device driver has to be loaded. Once the device service driver is loaded, we have to provide the interrupt service routine. So, if I am providing a uh, interrupt service uh, routine has to be run, this has to be given the topmost priority, then the scheduler has to, uh, uh, I mean uh, suspend the work of or uh, block the state of the current uh, task which is running and it has to provide CPU for the interrupt service routine. Uh, for that particular IO request. Once it is over, then it has to go for, it has to go ahead with the current running uh, process. So, this has been done through preemptions. So, we need to go for preemptions when you are looking at some of the places where we wanted to disturb the regular schedule of your scheduler algorithms. So, the first thing is we have uh, when uh, I mean why we use preemptive scheduling is if I am looking at some of the scheduling which which never uses the preemptions which will not give you a, a best results. That means, when you are looking at cooperative schedulers where an interrupt for the service from the first I mean when, when, when you are assuming that an interrupt for the service from the first task occurs just at the beginning of the second task, but the first task services waits till all the remaining is listed. Uh, and at the uh, or the queued task has to be finished, then only the service for the uh, first task is uh, given time time slot. So, now we will be getting this latency is very very high, that means, that means this I can say that it is a worst case latency which equals the sum of execution times of all the tasks. The whole hyper period the system may be almost the whole hyper period the system has to wait to get its to get a time slot so that the interrupt can be run. This this is happening with your cyclic scheduling which will occur with your cooperative scheduling. So, cooperative schedulers will not accept preemptions, it will go on what will be the time slot which has been allotted has to be run for that particular task only. So, because of that we will be uh, having a very high latency uh, so that uh, this will not be an efficient method of handling a real time situations. So, when you are looking at preemptive scheduling, 
the OS schedules the higher priority task such a way that when it is ready and when it preempts a lower priority by blocking. So, overcome this problem of large worst case latency, this, this preemption uh, with respect to priority based, priority based uh, preemptions which will overcome the problem of the large worst case latency for high priority task. So, the scheduler schedules preemption of lower priority process by higher priority processes. So, each task, task has an infinite loop from start up to finish. So, when you are looking at preemptive scheduling, a real time uh, system always looking at uh, a, a scheduling which can be preempted by high priority task. So, if that is the case, uh, if I am looking at a multitasking RTOS, this has to support preemptions. So, when you are looking at uh, preemptions where the program code uh, has to be compute the time bound as well as R the time bound. So, now uh, the program code is an I O bound or a computer bound cannot be allowed to monopolize a system resource or if a more important task requires the same resource. So, this is uh, one particular uh, scenario when you are looking at preemption is when it is I mean preemption is very very important and it is required. So, somebody cannot uh, hold uh, the system resources because of that we cannot schedule it. So, we will be looking at the interrupts that, that, that is the best example for preemption. Uh, preemption is needed while the I O devices is requesting for the in service that means giving an interrupts. So, uh, when you are looking at preemption, preemptive scheduling this will be in four states one is running state, ready state, inactive state and blocked state. So, the task is controlled uh, task is in control of CPU is running state if, if the task is ready and it has to receive control of CPU is ready state. Inactive is the task is blocked by preemption and requires initialization in order to become ready. Blocked is the task is waiting for something to happen, maybe it is requiring some I O devices or some resources is needed. So, because of that it gets blo blocked. So, uh, preemptive scheduling model will be looking at uh, these four states based on that it works. So, it just uh, give this information gives you an idea about how the preemptive scheduling is working. So, now you just see that uh, one particular task is running, the scheduler makes this particular task is running, suddenly it is getting an interrupt. So, now this suspends the work of this low priority task that means the context switching occurs and the ISR of what will be the interrupt provided which will be given the topmost priority this uh, has been taken and the higher priority task is run. Now, till the higher priority task is run then we will be after that the same low priority. So, once this higher priority is run again the context switching is occurs. So, that what will be the content which is saved for this low priority task is reloaded back and it is allowed to continue over there. So, now you just see that when I am looking at the time though it has been allotted for the time of a low priority task because of the higher priority task is uh, task preempts at this particular uh, time, it is it has been allotted the time, CPU runs this particular high priority task, then again uh, it reloads the contents of the low priority task con uh, system contents. So, from there onwards it continues and it finishes off uh, that particular task. So, when you are uh, looking at the commercial, commercial real time kernels which are all preemptive so that you can run any of the uh, processes which will which has some of the things has to be given topmost priority. So, when you are looking at the pre preemptive scheduling uh, each task, task has a priority relative to all other tasks. The most critical task is assigned the highest priority and the highest priority task that is ready to run gets the control of the processor and a task runs until it, it yields terminates or blocks. blocks. So, e each task has its own memory stack before a task can run it may it must load its context from its memory stack and if the task is preempted it must save its current state then the context is restored when the task is given control of the processor. So, the when, when you are looking at preemptive scheduling we have certain advantage certain disadvantage. Advantage is the task level response time is minimized as well as the execution of highest priority task is deterministic. The disadvantage is 
it, sh it should not use non redundant functions unless exclusive access to these functions is ensured. So, when you are looking at real time operating systems, uh, it, 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 uh, it is understood that preemptive kind of scheduling is uh, best, so that the real time situations can be handled effectively with respect to uh, embedded systems. So, in this lecture we discussed about the basic scheduling policies. After that we have discussed about some of the basic schedules like uh, time division multiplexing as well as uh, round robin scheduling and uh, at the end we have discussed about uh, how the context switching as well as the preemption is important when you are looking at real time operating systems as well as priority based scheduling. So, you can refer these books for this particular topics. Thank you.